years and years, there was always smoke over these houses. Fine mornings, good times. I've been mayor here for 20 years. 20 years in March. I've lived on the hill where I could watch the people. Men and women who lived by machines and bought machine-made goods. And slept and were wakened to go to the machines. <laughs> I remember when those factories were built. We were pretty happy about it. Concrete and glass and steel. Why, it was like money in the bank. More machines, more jobs. 36 million more men at work in the last 70 years. 18 new industries in the country. Millions of new jobs. Automobiles, gas, radio. Men wanted. Men wanted. Well, what about the men? That's a complicated question. Sometimes the change was slow. Machinery didn't always disturb our lives. The old jobs went, there was trouble, but we got new jobs. Take Russell, for example. Used to make carriages. Lived next door to me a good many years. He took to making parts for engines. A man with skilled hands like Tom can turn them to another trade if the work is not too far different. Even the older men had not so much trouble as you'd think. Some machines needed skilled men, almost as many as before. And this work was easier on the back. Or Bill Johansson used to be a brakeman on the railroad that ran from the junction across to our town. Now there's a bus runs right alongside the old track. He was out of work about six months. Now he's turning out parts for diesel engines. Same engines that helped put him out of his job. And that's the way it was. And machines like this, machine looms, came in pretty gradually. Everybody knew they were coming. Times were good. Men had a chance to look around, move to another state move into our town, because they heard about our new luck. The steel rolling mill, 3,000 jobs, had to have skill, had to have strong arms and hard nerves. There it was, money for 3,000 families. The machines brought life to our town.
Good times make good Christmas. Big payrolls from the steel mill, the engine plant, the weaving mill. Plenty of money in town and it went to buy food and clothes. The same all over the country. Machines making cheaper goods and more of them and new kinds of products. Quite a few new stores too. A lot of the young people got selling jobs in those stores and clerical jobs in the offices. Not so long ago either. My own youngest daughter got married. A Christmas marriage. Rang all the church bells in town. We thought prosperity would last forever. We were able to buy good products shipped from other industrial towns, from everywhere in the U.S. And we shipped our goods in return. The wheels kept going around. thought prosperity would last forever. Now it was over. We hoped it would return. But the machines were idle a long time. So were the men. It wasn't the fault of the machines. We can't blame them for depression. In fact, machines had often created jobs. But now there was depression. I never thought I'd see it snow on those rollers, two-thirds of the town on relief. Then when recovery began, when there were orders for steel again, the old mill stayed shut. The years had brought a new method, a new machine, automatic high-speed strip mill. For every 30 men who worked before, now there is one. No more strain on the back and shoulders. No more work for 3,000 families. Automatic, high speed, powerful, accurate. Never gets tired, never gets sick. What the devil am I going home for? 
just to walk in the door and say, no job again? Is that what for? There he is, the old South. He used to have a job. Mrs. Kavanke and Jack Kavanke, way out in Pittsburgh, trying to land a job there. Well, I'm here. I'm trying to keep the home together here. Home. Nice home. We gotta get out of this dump soon. Pete and Joe, we used to hang around together, working at the mill. And now, now I can't stand to look at their faces. They're thinking, and I'm thinking, when is that mill gonna open again? When do we work? There's nothing wrong with me. I can still work. I'm okay. Walk in the door, tell her the same old thing, tell her that again, see that look in her eyes again. I don't want to go home. What am I going home for? What the devil am I going home for? For me and my kids, 60 cents. For his lunch, another 25 cents, that makes 85, then there's milk for the baby. I knew it. All right. Don't let him see nothing. Sit down. Give him his dinner. This ain't anything sudden. It happens every day. And if I said today it'll be different, today you'll come back and tell me, oh well, forget it. Where was I? 85 and 20 cents from a dollar 10 leaves. What does it leave? You add up the pennies, finding there's always just not enough. So far you can eat, and over your head is some kind of roof. And then you ask yourself, how long? What happens after all you saved is gone? Is he scared to look how soft are his hands from not working so long? Oh.
that they tell you we're living in a wonderful age. The age of machines and gadgets and things. An age to wonder at. All right. I'm wondering. I'm wondering how much I... You can't do no more than try. As long as the old mill was there, we kept on hoping. We kept our eyes on it. Maybe they'll reopen, maybe next month. But when they cut those smokestacks out of the sky, we had nothing to look at anymore. Decent, fine workmen, every one of them. Their hands were trained, but now that training is no good. They're no more than unskilled men until they learn a new skill. But why? We're all good men here and we know our jobs. Why are we finished? Because the strip mills can make the steel cheaper. They can make it cheaper, but they can't make it as good. <laughs> they can make it as good and cheaper and faster. That's what these new machines are like. But what good are the machines if they throw us out of work? Labor-saving machines can make more goods for more people. But the machines have come so fast that the displaced workers have not been able to learn new skills and find other jobs. Why should these men be thrown away as if they were obsolete, as if they were broken machines? I'm only 25 years old. I'm not obsolete. Maybe we could get them to bring some new factories into the city. I'm a steel worker. I worked in a mill 20 years. I couldn't go to work making radios or refrigerators if I did get a job. It's the same way with millions of trained men. It hit our town hard and sudden. But it's not a local problem, not these days. Our town by itself can't feed these men, can't afford to retrain them. It's a bigger thing than one mayor in one town can possibly handle. It's a national problem. A man may be through at his old occupation, but he still can be trained for another job. In the last 10 years, we've let our reservoir of skill run seriously low. Millions of workers have been idle in each of these 10 years. That means millions of man years of work experience lost, of skills allowed to rust. We've needed a retraining program for a long time. Industries need machinists, mechanics, skilled workers of every kind. 
Methods change, all right. Let's train the men for new jobs. Let's teach them versatile skills. It's taken an emergency to get us started on a nationwide scale. But what we learned this year about the problem, about teaching new skills to displaced workers, can help a peacetime economy as well as national defense. We need trained men more than ever today. Schools in our town and hundreds of others are training men for new jobs. The men who worked in the old steel mill can learn to handle lathes and drills. The men who knew one operation can be trained for a wider usefulness. We're meeting a crisis now. Government and industry are working together to retrain these men. When the crisis is passed, let's remember what we've learned. New automatic processes will keep on coming. We need them. But let's keep the workers up to date. Let's keep their skills as modern as the new machines.